And we'll start with Luca De Vico, who is going to continue with this uh, excellent conference. So yes, so is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, for everybody, for still being here. I hope you paid attention to Andy's uh, talk uh, because we are, yes, we are going to continue on that one. Um, basically, I had the intention of to just be giving a nutshell what it's like only coming, but I think I did a marvelous job. So I'll skip that and I'll show you three cool cases or three interesting cases that we start try to study with uh, this code and showing a little bit of what uh, we plan to do in the next future. Uh, yes, exotic coupling, yes, uh, as Andy said, it's relevant once two or more chromophores are close to each other, you have interactions within different electronic states. Uh, possibly you may have seen this kind of uh, spectra, this uh, now is uh, it's start to be a uh, 10 years old uh, techniques, but it's still very much uh, uh, on the ball and, and uh, being sought after. So you have two dimensional spectrum and you have chromophores, different chromophores interacting with each other and you have to somehow describe how they do this interaction. And yes, we have been talking about J and H coupling, so I'm not gonna go there more. Uh, let's start with uh, some uh, cool cases. Um, we decided to test the code also on azulin. Azulin is this molecule here. Uh, why we chose the atom belt? Because it's a, it's a interesting molecule because it's, it's aromatic, it's isomeric with the naphthalene, but why naphthalene is totally apolar, completely transparent, azulin, as the name says, azul from the Spanish is blue, and as uh, this very strong dipole moment. And for the, those who may know a bit of spectroscopy, it's also interesting because it breaks Kasha's rules. So if you photo excite this molecule, it goes from some excited states and then will fluoresce from S2 and not from S1, which is what is commonly expected and is Commonly referred as the Kasha school. Um, this guy uh, mostly has uh, strong absorption uh, UV uh, part of the spectrum and the smaller parts down here. Um, we do have also available uh, a crystal structure from uh, yeah, a few years ago. Uh, so we should be able to uh, compute energetics of a single monomer and then do couplings among all of them and see if we can re recover some of the properties of this crystal. Uh, so I started to do this project with uh, Berto, a student of mine. Uh, we geometry optimized structure, cast CF level. This basis set uh, 10 electrons in 10 pi and pi star orbitals. We did not impose symmetry because why? Anyway, it just it's fast enough even without, and it comes out very nice. Then, uh, after getting the, the geometry, I decided to insert uh, Reaper orbitals because this guy does not do only pi pi star excitations. There are also Reaper orbitals uh, included. So I put Gauss atom somewhere here, the center of mass, and I did the ad hoc orbitals Reaper style. Small. Uh, note the current tutorial on the website for how to create big orbitals. I think they're a bit outdated. And before you ask me, yes, I'm willing to rewrite just that little part on how to do <laughs> Rydberg orbitals. With that, hopefully, is going to keep on working for at least a few uh, years. Um, so then uh, we went and did. Uh, some uh, computing some electronics in study states. So we have all the pi, that here are just one and one pi star, and included them on the active orbitals also uh, S like and the three P like uh, Rydberg orbitals. And so then we kind of went to a 
state have uh, the castles you have eight roots uh zero one level shift and then re recompute everything uh, with a multi-state cast pt2 with the imaginary level shift of 0 0.1 um yesterday just yes if i remember correctly we also heard about uh should we have ipa0 ipa0.25 which is the older default i think right now i tried both of them no changes in excitation energies and i've been now been trying all different flavors of uh cast multi-state cast pt2 for the moment just multi-state and xdw planning on to also extend the rest for the moment no changes in excitation energy at least for this one uh one case um these are the computer excitation energies that we got at the moment however this number and this number are too similar i don't trust them i, I need to really triple check everything it's too good to be true like this so i, I don't um yeah i'm has to be taken with a big pinch of salt these ones uh as you see most of these uh excitation seems to have a very poor or small oscillator strength so following uh and this talk it should be important to be able to uh, treat correctly uh, whichever is going to be the coupling of the, these guys you cannot really use uh, dipole dipole uh, approximation so that's where we are because this is more or less really a work in progress nothing is really have been completed yet uh, but uh, we should be able to compute all possible couplings within the different units uh one thing that you may or may not have noticed from andy's talk is that it's a great thing that with his implementation now we just have to compute basically this monomer and then since here we have just simple uh rigid translation we already have also the energy for these other three guys and the same goes with this one so basically for the price of computing the energetics of two molecules which yes the wave function components will be different but the energetics of course has to be the same then we can just compute all the coverings all, all of them so that's obviously a great uh, enhancement about instead of trying to compute the whole system all together so that's again this is totally work in progress so that's where we are right now um what we have been doing already with actually the slightly previous version of of the code is to go and look for small bigger molecules the so bacterial chlorophylls which are involved in mostly the, the most yeah, the most active participant in collecting uh sunlight in uh, LH2, LH1 uh, systems that are used in many bacteria to co co then get ATP. Uh, basically, uh, here we have antenna systems that translate this energy down to this other bigger guy. Then you have a reaction center here, again, based on bacterial chlorophylls that will uh, separate charges and do something. So this is bacterial chlorophyll. Uh, this already started uh, started studying it a few years back. Uh, so we just cut away the the part that is a saturated cell. The tail doesn't really matter. Um, so we have a rather extended conjugate pi conjugated system, and you can compute uh, first excitation energies of this at uh, multi-state state average process here yeah. that uh as i said you have 26 electrons 25 orbitals so this is uh process here yeah, type of wave function 11 for 10 uh, orbitals three holes three excitations and then also a few other tricks to keep the calculation a bit more uh, manageable freezing uh, orb uh orbitals after the SCF and not having too many virtual orbitals. And this is this basically works. Uh, so we got 
the site energy, so the energies of the single bacterial chlorophylls. And then at that time, uh, where we published the 2020 over Monkas paper, in the supporting information, Francesco put something about, oh, well, maybe we could compute Frankel excitonic coupling using the Cholesky infrastructure. That this is what then uh, gave rise to everything that Andy has been doing later on. Um, so again, with Roberto, we, we used that hmm, more, uh, how to say, uh, uh, not so mature code that was uh, at, at the time uh, to go and compute uh, couplings between uh, alpha, beta, and beta, alpha uh, monomers in the LH2. Uh, basically, uh, the crystallographers and uh, biologists, they like to, to dis distinguish between this type of dimers between the, this, they call it this the true dimer of these two bacterial chlorophylls because they are close to each other while these two guys are supposed to be less just uh, friendly neighbors but not really uh, getting so close to each other. And actually you, we could see that indeed there were differences in the computed uh, coupling between the, <coughs> these two uh, couples of dimers um so the with the two close ones showing a, a larger coupling the more far apart each other uh, smaller uh coupling. um as Andy said we would expect that these uh, relative positions of the position type moments of the of the monomers would give rise to um j aggregates and um, and the same, we would expect the same for the reaction center, which is uh, reported here. Uh, again, the reaction center is, as they say, where the magic happens. So where uh, you have separation of charge and give rise to the function of the problem. Strangely enough, here, this, this is the case where we have actually lowest uh, coupling between these three systems that we checked. So, I don't know if that's really meaningful for the biological function or not. We are still studying that. Uh, but having these uh, couplings, we could uh, then compute the uh, excitonic states. And here we see that, yes, we have J aggregates where the, we have redshifts, so the lowest states are those that are actually permitted. And we have here these uh, blue arrows, and the <laughs> higher states are the red arrows that are not allowed uh, transitions. Um, having played with the bacterial chlorophylls, with the whole system, decided to go for uh, smaller molecules. So there's some derivatives uh, that basically, thanks to the help of uh, Daniela Padula and uh, my student Anna, then we started to play with the uh, smaller uh, versions of the bacterial chlorophyll testing the the curvature. Uh, this was at first time everything I had to admit it with the DFT and TDDFT. But then uh, I got another student, Razan, and she started uh, studying these guys also at proper uh, multi state Casp2, Rasp2 level. So, we, for example, we could see that these guys can tune their excitations mostly due to stabilization, destabilization of the ground state. And then lately we are starting now to play with saying, okay, what happens if we start to take two of these molecules and we uh, start to orient them themselves one to respect to the other, different distances, different uh, relative rotations. Um, so, of course, uh, yes, if you see them like that, they are very much parallel one to the other which means that we expect H aggregates, and that's exactly what we obtain. Uh, all these, yeah, maybe I should have done the, with the colors inverted, but yes, these are the, uh, the blue ones are the actual uh, second excitation, which is the permitted one. So when they are perfectly parallel, basically there is one 
permitted, peak permitted uh, excitation, and the other one is basically zero. Then you start to rotate, and you see that it comes up more and more of also permission of the lowest excitation. When the, the two guys are basically 90 degrees from each other, there is zero coupling. Both uh, excitations are as if the two molecules were by themselves in the uh, in the universe. Um, so that's more or less now again where we are. This is again uh, very much work in progress uh, to use the, the code by Andy. And the idea is to really understand how one could tune the coupling and how could you tune the spectrum of just not just a single bacterial product derivative, but possibly an aggregate of them. Um, going forward, uh, my uh, long time collaborator, Thorsten Hansen in Copenhagen with uh, his student, uh, Leah, they are trying now to use same technology on uh, chlorophyll, actually from photosystem two, uh, which is uh, challenging because it's yet again, even larger uh, active space than bacterial chlorophylls. Uh, she has been computing now just the side energies of the single units. Another side note, uh, these transition dipole moments that she was, uh, she had been computing, one of them is wrong. The, this, because the, this part is basically nearly the same molecule. So the sign should be the same. Uh, but as you can see here, one goes from the two fused rings to the one, and this goes from the one to the two. One of them is wrong. Uh, the problem is that these transition type of moments sometimes seem to have a very random sign. Maybe we should go and take a look into the Rassi code, or maybe it's been already done. I don't know if it's, if it's the case. Anyway, uh, with that, yes, I would like to. There is a huge list of acknowledgments. Of course, everybody in Rostock, everybody in Copenhagen. Francesco Aguilante now is in Lausanne. Uh, everybody is in Siena. So we have now Ciro, Guido, and Daniele Padura has been collaborating with me. All the, my students, Anna, Alberto, Roberto, Emanuela, and Razan. Of course, the whole Open Morcas community is always great to be working for, with you and all these guys that just give us a little bit of money. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So we have time for a few questions. Uh, so Felix is saying that the sign of the transition moment has no physical meaning. It is reversed if the sign of the wave function changes. Yes, the problem is that, okay, if you have just a monomer, who cares? Uh, you're perfectly right. Uh, the point is that once you start to have uh, aggregates, then it, has importance to, 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 to know how do they couple. So it would be nice to be consistent, let's say. I don't care. Okay, let's not call it right and wrong. Let's just say that we should be consistent. If I have nearly the same molecule, that, uh, that sign here should be the same. I should not have to go and uh, play around with it. But yes, in principle, but by itself, it's not a uh, piece. But uh, yeah. I think the main problem is that when, when you uh, take the results from one calculation and then do another one, you have to make sure that you keep the sign of the wave function and mm -hmm. not uh, like the alter it arbitrarily, which might happen in some cases when you do mm -hmm. like the uh, Rasi. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we need something to. to a tool to block the sign of the wave bunch. Uh, so it's a comment to the question. Um, so it's, it's what I also mentioned in my book. I don't remember that I mentioned, but I put it on the slide. Uh, so we also explain the six neural problem in dynamic. Of course, uh, the transition dipole itself is not an observable thing. Uh, it's only it's square, it's all square. It's like but uh, if one does dynamics of the response function for outer preservation function, we have the transition dipole itself. 
So I want to relate uh, the transition diapers of the different time spectrum. What we observe is uh, that, um, uh, of course, the phase of the wave function due to that distance is changing to the same. But if the phase of bra is changing, and the phase of head is changing, the total uh, element should stay the same. Uh, but sometimes we have seen that there is some bad present phase, and this can destroy our correlation. So the level one is huge. You can always track and track the, the proper sign to the from zero and zero. But if it's small, so it's oscillating at you know, zero, so then that can just start similar for you. Okay, uh, I think we can continue this discussion later if you want. So thanks again for the count. <laughs>